Okay, ready to go now. Had to do a little pacing, get that out of the way since I'm not going to be able to pace uh, doing this video. And uh, that's a tough thing for me because I really enjoy talking about this stuff. Uh, phenomenology, big long word, you probably never heard it before. Uh, but I think it's uh, a profoundly important perspective. And uh, it's, it's my own background. Uh, my own uh, training is in this area. And so I want to share it with you. Um, and I get really excited about that. So anyway, uh, but b before I jump into it, before I, I start talking about phenomenology and, and trying to clarify some of what you read and maybe make some connection to why it matters in psychology and whatnot, um, let me let me start with this. Um, and I, I, I just, maybe I'm repeating myself, maybe I've already done this before, but uh, I want to make sure everybody understands that the thing that's different about my class in history of psychology uh, from other classes in history of psychology that other professors would teach uh, here at BYU, other universities, whatever, is, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, I'm, I'm not as interested, I hope you've figured this out this semester, I'm not as interested in just going down the chronology and uh, walking up uh, at the end of the class being uh, totally walked up to today. What's going on right this minute? And you, you've walked through all the names, all the developments, sort of that. I'm, I'm interested in the ideas. Now, so we have been moving chronologically, right? But I've been mostly interested in the ideas and when, when possible to, to step back from whoever we've been talking about or reading about, whatever the ideas are, and consider alternative ideas, right? So, uh, for example, just recently, right, uh, William James. I mean, even though he's uh, universally recognized as uh, one of the most important founders of modern psychology and, and all psychologists, uh, you know, pay obeisance to the name of William James. Mm, yeah, nobody reads him, nobody thinks about him because, his psychology, his ideas, his philosophy, his whole viewpoint would have taken psychology in a very different direction than it has gone. It went in the direction of the behaviorists, went in the direction of uh, the biologists, um, and went in a very reductive and deterministic uh, direction, which uh, James was quite opposed to, right? Uh, so James uh, constitutes an alternative, and I spent a lot of time on him because I want to I want you to see the alternative to what you learn in all of your other psychology classes and what is um, what is taken to be kind of the mainstream, right? Uh, did the same thing with Kierkegaard, right? Not not a big name in psychology. You're probably going to go the rest of your your time in psychology, uh, never really encountering him again, and yet uh, he offers a profoundly different, you know, view. Of what it means to be a person and how psychology could be conducted, what its real questions are, what its methods ought to be, um, and and also he he offers a contrast to the overwhelmingly secular naturalistic view of contemporary psychology. He's a believing Christian and he's going to ground uh, his science of the psyche of the soul of the person in a relationship with God. That's an alternative, right? So. Um, most history of psychology classes don't do that, right? They don't look at what psychology could have been or where there were other possibilities that things could have developed differently. They just simply kind of say, well, this is, uh, this is who said what, and this, said, this person said it here, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And you kind of get a, a sense of determinism, that the, this is the way it had to happen, and it's just, uh, and, and even a sense that this is the best that could have happened, right? Um, I don't subscribe to that view. I think that uh, there's possibility all the time. Things don't always work out for the best, and there are always other ways that we could go about doing what we're doing. Uh, so that's that's a, an answer to one of the other questions that students will come up with in my class is, where's the 20th century, Dr. Kent? It's like, uh, you, you walk us up to, to the 20th century, really, and then not much more, right? Um, 
you get to the end of your class, Dr. Gant, and we haven't really studied any of the psychological developments or theorists uh, of the 20th century, uh, or even now into the 21st century. Um, I'd answer that by saying, first, yeah, we have. I, I try to bring them up all the time. Like, if we're talking about somebody uh, in the past, I try and say, see how, for example, when we talked about Rousseau, I want you to know, hey, Rousseau and his ideas, we see them in modern psychology, in humanistic psychology, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, right? Uh, when you're talking about um, John Locke and uh, David Hume and Thomas Hobbes, we're talking about empiricism and egoism and associationism, all that. It's like, so th their behaviors, and that's, you have Skinner, that's Pavlov and his slobbering dogs, and that's, you know, so to make the connection. So I do, do try to keep that in uh, and make those connections for you. But, uh, but this, the other way I would answer it, the other thing I would say is, well, <clears throat> I really want to make sure that we understand the alternatives to the mainstream so that we can compare ideas and be genuinely informed and make informed decisions. Uh, and even more deeply, more importantly, in many, many ways, folks, Contemporary psychology, even though we're in the 21st century and we've got these multi-million dollar MRI scanning brains, we've got, uh, you know, well over 100 years of, uh, of research studies and all of that sort of thing going on and all these therapeutic developments, intellectually speaking, philosophically speaking, at the conceptual level of what we're doing, what we're studying and how we think about the object of our study as psychologists, as we think about people, we're stuck firmly in the 19th century, really near the end. We haven't made much conceptual advance. And so it's pretty easy to get all of the intellectual ter terrain laid out by the end of the 19th century. And you can see all of the ways in which we're still playing with those ideas. That's why I talked about Newton and Hobbes at such length, because as you look around modern psychology, as you take your other courses in psychology, you'll look at these theories, these research studies, these ideas, these practices um, that we use in psychology today that everybody uses, and you say, oh, that, that's just Hobbes. That's a Hobbesian theory of motivation. We don't mention Hobbes. We don't. We use these other terms uh, that we've come up with, but it, you can see it's just Hobbesianism. Or, or wow, that's just really a Newtonian way of explaining human behavior. Or that research method that I'm studying in this class is this is firmly rooted in ideas in the 19th century. We have we haven't done much conceptually since then, right? Uh, so that's one of the reasons that um, we kind of stop around the end of the 19th century. Today's topic, we're moving into the 20th century a little bit um, because uh, some of the most important uh, phenomenological thinkers uh, were doing their work in the early part of the 20th century. But uh, anyway, so I, I just want to make sure that that's out there, that by the end of this class, whether you've liked the class or you've hated the class, whether you liked me or hated me or you thought you learned something or you didn't learn anything or, or whatever, at least if somebody asked you why Dr. Gant taught the class the way he did, you could look back and say, well, he's, he was concerned about alternative perspectives, uh, the, the development of ideas over time, and how beholden we are to ideas in the past, how modern psychology, we, think, we like to think we're on the cutting edge of new thoughts and new, new ideas, and, and yet we really are spinning our wheels in certain ways and just playing out ideas that are really, really very old. Uh, and sometimes those ideas aren't very good ones, right? Uh, and that there were other ideas. Things could have turned out differently than they did and so on and so forth. Well, I just hope you can, you get that, okay? Well, okay, enough, enough of that. Uh, spend half this silly video talking about stuff besides what the video is about. So let me let me get you to phenomenology and human science right uh, so a phenomenological approach is one in psychology that wants to focus uh on the study of psychology uh not as patterned after the natural sciences but rather focused expressly on human beings and it has a lot more in common with 
the approach to understanding human beings we find in the humanities. And so it's a, a kind of a, we'll talk about it as a human science um, rather than just a branch of natural science. Uh, phenomenology, as the, the slide here says, it's a philosophical approach applied to psychology. Uh, because both philosophy and psychology are human sciences. They're, they're attempts to generate knowledge and understanding about human beings. And specifically, phenomenology wants to study phenomenon, right? Meaning experiences, what occurs, what happens to us, the meaningfulness of existence itself, right? That's, that's what it's about. Um, so two of the most important figures that we'll talk about are Edmund Husserl, and Martin Heidegger. Uh, but before I can talk about Husserl and Heidegger and their contributions um, to this notion of, uh, of studying human experience as it's lived, right, in its concreteness, um, and, and you probably, I hope you're already sensing there's some resonance here with James, right? Uh, James was actually quite influential uh, uh, and was quite influenced by thinkers like Husserl and, and others. Um, anyway, but the focus, uh, b before we get into talking about their approach, uh, there's somebody I want to talk about first. I want to back us up just a little bit, lay the groundwork, because everybody is always responding to people who came before them, right? That's just the nature of intellectual discourse. Uh, you don't just throw something out and it comes out of nowhere, full blown, you know, from the head of Zeus, kind of like Athena. No. You're responding to some ideas. You're critiquing them, offering an alternative, so on and so forth. Phenomenology is an alternative. Phenomenology is an alternative and a critique of rationalism, empiricism, and the whole positivist, scientific viewpoint that we call modernism, right? And so if, if we, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and dismiss, uh, that a little bit. Okay, so um, if, if we go back to Descartes, right, the father of modernism, uh, Descartes gave us here, visual aids, uh, the subject object split, right? We talked about that in class. Uh, you get the focus on where's knowledge? How do we know the world, right? And the rationalists are going to fall out on the side, well, the world is split into two parts, the, the internal and the external, the mental and the physical, the material, actually the immaterial, the material, mind, body, that sort of, they, they start with that presumption, right? Descartes gives us that. And all of his rationalist buddies who follow along, Spinoza, Kant, all the rest, right? They're gonna focus on subjectivity, on the mind, how the mind constructs reality, how truth, is discovered in the internal realm of the subject, right? The rational ego, the rational mind, rationality, abstract principles, that sort of thing. The empiricists, on the other hand, they're gonna be on this side uh, and they're gonna focus, they, they buy the subject object split and they focus on this side. We've talked about it before. They're gonna focus on the physical, the environmental, the external world and how it produces mind, how it produces our ideas, right? So you got, uh, they're both, both views. Both views are concerned with ideas, right? Reality is represented, is represent, represented, there's a word, okay. Let me try that again. Represented in ideas. Both views, the empiricists and the rationalists, both views are examples of what philosophers call representationalism. That's the idea that we don't have direct access to reality as it is, but instead, we have only access to the ideas of, of what we think reality is or uh, a representation, literally a re-presentation. Like it's, the, it's, it's not the thing itself, right? Uh, and you should, you should hear some echoes to Plato in this, right? We don't, we don't experience the world directly, the real world, the world of forms and ideas. We see them in representations in the world, right? Vague images, uh, approximations, uh, imperfect approximations of the real and the ideal. Well, some of that's still playing out with the rationalists and empiricists. The ideas are in the mind, 
The question is, did they start there or did they get put there? And the question is, uh, how, how do we determine whether our ideas are, wow. See, I get excited about this stuff and I just gotta, gotta not get so excited, but it's really cool stuff. I'm glad I didn't break my glasses. You know, when I started these videos, I thought to myself, this is gonna be embarrassing. I'm not comfortable with the whole medium, having it filmed and stuff, and that's not gonna be embarrassing. And then I, I slowly talked myself out of it. I said, you know what, no, you're a teacher. Um, it's not about being embarrassed, it's about sharing, it's about helping your students understand stuff. <clears throat> and now I realize that, no, in fact, with that, yeah, it, it's gonna be embarrassing. Profoundly so. Okay, back to this. Holy moly. Uh, anyway, okay, so here we go. Representation. It's ideas in the mind, right? Both sides. The rationalist and you, we don't, we don't know reality. We don't experience reality as it is. We only generate theories and ideas and images in our mind, and that's what we know. Um, and then the question is just, you know, are they generated by the mind or are they generated for the mind? That kind of thing, right? So you get a, a lot of problems there. Right, uh, and we've talked about a lot of the problems. You've encountered them. Kierkegaard is identifying some of those problems. James was identifying those problems. Uh, just the abstractionism of it all, right? Uh, and the idea that the the world is independent of us and it's there for us to control, to uh, you know get removed from it, detached from it, and contemplate it, and then control and explain, and predict, and all of that sort of stuff, right? Well. Here's the deal. Phenomenology as a movement is born really before, long before Husserl, right? Uh, much earlier in the 1800s, a guy by the name of Franz Brentano, he's a German uh, philosopher, might be Austrian, I don't remember. Anyway, the point, what's the difference? Sorry, there is a big difference. Anyway, he thought this was a huge problem, right? And so he proposed this. He said, look, what if that was a mistake from the beginning? What if Descartes got it wrong and everybody else who followed along, even though they were criticizing and rejecting Descartes in different, different ways, because they assumed that split, that hard and fast split between the inner self and the external world, what if that was all wrong? And so he made this argument. He said, what if, in fact, it's better for us to see this way that consciousness the mental realm is never separate from the external world from the world of things and stuff but they all are enmeshed in one thing there's one continuous act that as he said Brentano said to be conscious is to be conscious of. Consciousness is always consciousness of. Now, you're sitting there going, huh, what does that mean? Let me, and maybe you're not. Maybe you, you turned out long ago um, and you're peacefully sleeping at your desk and so on and so forth and don't, drooling all over the place. But here's what I mean. Let me, for those of you who are still awake for whatever reason, here's what I mean, right? So here's a book. A wonderful new book I just got about William James, right? It's a little small thing, it's a fascinating book. You gotta check it out. Anyway, here's a book, right? Uh, rationalism says, I have certain mental capacities and structures that are inborn. My sense organs are impacted by utterly meaningless brute stimuli. And my mind imposes meaning on that. This rectangular, multicolored object with specific dimensions on it is there in my visual space and it registers on my sense organs, but the mind takes those uh, chaotic, random, intrinsically meaningless sensory stimuli and imposes meaning on it. That's a book. It's an object, it's a, that, that's a book. That's what we call a book. Minds just do that, right? 
That's the rational side. The empiricist side says, well, no, what's happened is uh, you've gone through life and you've encountered objects like this and um, you've had these sensory impressions of redness and uh, size and black and tan and you know whatever. You've had sensory experience, or you felt these things, so on and so forth, and you've been uh, rewarded by your culture, by your friends, family, people you encounter, uh, when you call it a book, like they call it a book. It's an arbitrary thing, we just, and uh, what's a book? Well, now we'll give you a definition. A book is, and we've got this mental idea that's been created in our minds through processes of associating little stimuli together to produce complex ideas, like a book, right? But nobody, there's no stimulus for book. Book comes along a lot later produced in us, right? So, so what you get is the rationalists and the empiricists, they've got these two accounts of this, but you never, you know, they, here's the thing, you never actually, you're never actually with a book. You're in your head, right? You're messing around with an idea. There's this idea of book, and then the argument is, well, did the mind make the idea and impose it on the senses, or did the senses produce the idea, and so on and so forth, but there's no direct experience of the book, because you can never have direct experience of things as they really are outside the mind, right? Well, Brentano said, nonsense. No, that's not how it works. It's a book, right? That's us. I mean, really, folks, that's what Brentano was saying. He said, we pick up books. We see books. We open them. We read words, right? It's an eraser. For a whiteboard, it's it's a marker, right? Uh, you so for example, you could I you open the window, you look outside. There's a tree in the yard, right? And the rationalist and empiricist, the modern scientific way of dealing with that is well, there is an object x number of feet away that is reflecting certain light waves that are impacting the sense organs, uh, and out of that, the mind either imposes an order and a meaning on it. Oh, having processed all of this incoming stimulus information, that is a tree. That's what that object is. I'm having an experience of a tree, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I'm creating that here because there's no tree out there. There's just a stimulus reflector and producer an object of certain dimensions out there. And the empiricist said, well, no, it's not like that. It's that there's these stimuli coming in and they produce these responses. And as we were growing up, you know, we were kind of curious, what, do, what, is, what are these stimuli and what do they mean? And what do I call them? And mommy and daddy said, oh, that's a tree. And we went, oh, okay. And we were shaped to uh, interpret uh, the stimuli that are in themselves meaningless, just stimuli uh, of any sort. And we arbitrarily now call that a tree, and that's what's going on, right? But Brentano would say, and so would Husserl, and so would Heidegger come along later and say, no, you look out the window, what do you see? A tree. It's a tree. If we don't have direct access to the world, in terms of our meaningful experiences, then we're gonna be locked in representationalism, we're gonna be locked in our heads, and we're always gonna be haunted by the question of, how do we know our ideas match? I mean, does the world stimulate our brains to associate in ways that perfectly represent the world as it is? Is the mind is the mind, can, do we really know that the mind perfectly represents that external world, right? What do we do with that? We're haunted by that. How do we know stuff? How do we know, right? Um, and that becomes really important because then, then not only we worry about how do I know that the tree's a tree, but how do I know whether people are people, right? We get this important question in philosophy. Lots of people struggle with the problem of other minds. How do I know? you since my only access to you as a, a, a modern you know rationalist empiricist positivistic thinker whatever is 
as a collection of stimuli that have impacted me and I either put meaning on you or uh, the meaning has been created for me through my experiences, how, how do I know you? I never have real access to you. We can never ever really be together. At the best, we're just two separate stimulus configurations kind of bumping up against each other all the time. How do we ever share? How do we ever know anything outside of ourselves? outside of our own private experience or the workings of our own rational ego, right? The phenomenologists are saying, we can disappear all those problems. We can get rid of all those problems if we just start by denying Descartes' subject-object split. And let's focus on experience itself because we experience the world as real. We experience the world as meaningful. It doesn't, doesn't mean that we're not fooled by things, right? It's not we're perfectly clear about everything going on, but we always have experience and it's empirically, it's there, right? It's, and, and so the focus then becomes on meaning, right? Meaning isn't, in, in for the rationalists and the empiricists, the romanticists even, uh, meaning is derivative. There's all these natural processes going on that have no meaning, but somehow magically out of that meaning arises. Understanding, you know, and, and what's meaning? You say, what, what's he talking about? Meaning, meaning, the meaning of life? Yeah, that's there too, but book, this is a meaning. This is a meaning in the world, right? A mouse, this, it means something. It's not an indifferent nothingness that, it, it has intrinsic meaning. The desk I'm at, the computer, all these things are intrinsically meaningful. There are meanings in the world, and that's what we experience first and foremost. That's our basic experience from the get-go. And someone like Heidegger came along and he said, looks like, uh, yeah, not, not only did, did Descartes put us down the wrong path, and create all of these conundrums for us, free will, determinism, mind, body, nature, nurture, all of that inner, outer, you know, all of that, individual self, other people. Not only did Descartes set up all those problems for us, but um, it seems like he did it because philosophy itself got obsessed with abstraction. Now, this goes back to my discussion long ago in the class about Hebrew versus Greek thinking. A central feature of Greek thinking is abstractionism, right? You haven't really gotten knowledge unless you have some abstract ideas to really and po to point to and focus on. Those are, that's reality and everything else is explained by that. And so this, the world of your experience isn't as, as real, but, but the ideas, the concepts, the constructs, the variables, all of those, the laws, the principles, all that stuff, that's real. Well, I was saying that philosophy went wrong when it did that. That we ought to start with experience as lived. Meaning is the starting point. Human experience is intrinsically meaningful. That's where we start. And we don't explain it away by resorting to abstractions. Now, it doesn't mean we can't use abstractions. In, in fact, we're gonna to have to. Language is abstracting to begin with. But, you focus on life as lived. You take that seriously from the get-go, right? And that helps you avoid reductionism, right? So we quit talking about love as a secretion of oxytocin in the limbic system, governed by certain principles of neurotransmission and, um, reinforcement or punishment in the external world or uh, something that's produced by certain abstract needs that generate behaviors, all that, get into that whole elaborate system. Instead, we look at, well, what does, what does that mean? What does being in love mean? What's it look like? How do people do it? Let's talk to them. Let's share it, right? Uh, let's, let's describe it. We're so busy trying to explain it in terms of things that aren't loving, aren't meaningful, aren't relational, have no meaning, agency, purpose, any of that stuff. Well, let's, let's hold off on that and just get a grip on what's it like to be in love. And 
does does that show up differently for different people at different times in their lives and different relationships? Are there different ways of loving and being in love, right? And yeah, okay, oxytocin may have some role to play in the experience of love, but love's more than oxytocin. It's more than any neurochemical or set of neurochemicals. It's more than any set of environmental stimuli or needs or drives or urges or any socialization processes and systems and informational inputs and outputs and all that stuff. It's something we live. It's how we live, right? We could talk about anything that way. Everything from love to fear, anxiety to depression, to happiness, to glee, to being competitive, to playing golf, singing a song, writing a book, reading a book, riding a bike, whatever, right? Um, but look at it in terms of well, what's the meaning? How does this mean stuff here? Well, let me, let me, let me go back and, and circle back here and, and do some things. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out the whiteboard in and I'm going to use it again. I'm going to try desperately not to knock off my own glasses when I do this. Uh, when I hold this up here, but I want to introduce you to a concept that Heidegger brings out. Um, because, so, so for Heidegger, it was really important to start over in some way, right? Um, because in a lot of ways, he realized if philosophy had gone wrong early, even before Descartes, with its concern for abstractions and representational thought, and, and then you get Descartes and the subject object split and all that. We can't, we can't just fix it by doing the same old thing again, right? Remember, if you watched the Kierkegaard video, there's a wonderful quote, because and Heidegger was heavily influenced by Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard talks about, you know, you can't answer Kant in his own terms, in his own language. You, that's precisely not to answer him at all. You're still playing that game, right? So what Heidegger is going to say is we got to start differently. We can't use the same old language. We can't use the same terms because they're all loaded with conceptual baggage and they're going to sidetrack us. So we're not going to talk about subjects and objects, internal consciousness and external uh, entities and their, their representational relationships and all that. You try and do that. You try and talk about individual minds and rational egos and all that stuff. You're just going to be right back in the soup again with Descartes and Kant and Locke and Hume and all the rest of them, right? And so what Heidegger does is he, he, he gives us this interesting word. It's a German word, Dasein. Not design, but Dasein. Um, and in German, uh, it literally means existence, right? Um, but Heidegger breaks it down into its two parts, right? There is uh, da, which is used to mean either here or there. It's the point of where is something, uh, da, or where are you, da, right? Uh, kind of here or there, right? It's, and then sign is, uh, uh, sign is being, existing, right? And so he uses this word to refer to the human way of being, right? Not just... The, so he doesn't want to talk about minds, the human mind, the human self, the human soul. That's what he wants to talk about the human way of being. So he's not pointing at a thing. He's pointing at a way, a how, an activity, an event in the world, an ongoing. Because for Heidegger, that's what's that's really fundamental to us, is we're, we're agents. We're active beings in a world that's constantly unfolding, and we're participating in that. And so he uses this word, Dasein, to refer to that being that is engaged meaningfully in a world of relationships and purposes. It's a historical being. We, we find ourselves in a world that predates us. We're thrown into this world, right? We find ourselves already all underway, right? Um, in, in a culture, in a language, so on and so forth, in relationships. And so another way he talks about Dasein here is being in the world. In der Welt sein, right? Uh, 
it's one word in German, you can do that, and it gets longer, he adds stuff to it. We got to hyphenate it in English. And the hyphens are important because what he's, he's trying to help us understand is that it's one unitary thing. Remember back the, the subject object thing, Brentano, it's one, it's one whole. People come in world size chunks, right? Well, I want to I want to break the word down a little bit for you to understand. So so you don't get caught up in trying to make sense of this in the good old fashioned Cartesian way. He's not talking about your individual mind locked inside your body somewhere, uh, ex, you know, uh, separated and divorced from an external world of objects out there. He's he's holistic through and through. We are in the world, the world is us. We constitute and construct a world of meaning, even as the world uh, of objects and others constitutes and constructs us. There's this mutual dance always going on. So he, uh, he wants to know this, this idea of being, right? Notice this word is wonderful in English uh, because it, it's both a, a thing and an and a, it's a noun and a verb, right? It's supposed to be a thing and an activity, right? A being, right? So I'm a being, you're a being. Uh, this is a being, right? It's a, a, we don't usually think of it that way, but what we're talking about, it's a thing. It's a, it has location, you can spot it. And, you know, there's this thing, this being, this entity, this thing, but it's also, you know, being, this is doing thinking, feeling, dreaming, hoping, fearing, running, you know, sleeping, singing, being bored right now by Dr. Gant and his overly elaborate yammering. Yammering, right? Okay, anyway, so he has to focus on this, this active, Dasein, the human way of being in the world is to be active, right? Being, your being in the world, it's something we do intrinsically because we're agents right we're not objects we're not isolated subjects we're activities we're events we're ongoing um in the world right now here's the thing you he's at pains Heidegger's at pains to say when i say being in the world when i'm talking about in the world i don't mean one object in another object or one special sort of object in another object. He's not, you're not in the world like water is in a glass, right? Like we're these um, subjective entities inserted into a world of objects. Uh, he's not, you're not like, you're not in like a hand is in a glove, okay? He says, you're, we're in the world. like being in love, being in a mood, right? I'm in a bad mood. Really, where's that located on a map? We're in, you're not in a mood, you're not in love in the way you're in a room, right? So because we occupy space, right? I could be in a room and, and I can be in the world as occupying a particular location on a map, but I'm more than that, right? I'm in and through the world. I, I'm, and the world here is not, it's not, it's not just or solely that huge physical object floating in space, hurtling around the sun that we're all sitting on, right? The world is, a nexus, he says, kind of, it's a nexus of our relationships and our histories and our purposes, our pasts, our futures. And so we're all, we are active, we are beings who are actively engaging in the world of those relationships. So we talk about, you know, the world of the mathematician is different than the world of the artist, right? We, talk, we might talk about, you know, uh, he's in his own little world right now, right? Or you know, where in the world is Carmen San Diego, right? The geography question. Or we might talk about you know, being in the world, but not of the world. What is, he says all of that. Dasein is all of those things all the time. And we lose focus 
We lose our focus, we lose our understanding, and we end up misunderstanding who we really are when we take ourselves to be subjects in a world of objects or just a particular kind of object, right? A meat machine, uh, a survival machine, what have you, right? Um, an organism responding to environmental stimuli and inputs or what have you. So we, we misunderstand that those are all abstractions. We made those up to explain ourselves to ourselves. And in the process, we've profoundly misunderstood ourselves because we didn't stick with the starting point, the brute empirical starting point is that is, is meaning is a world of meaningful relationships right and so heidegger talks about he says look we're not just being in the world right dasein is not just that's not enough he wants to expand it even farther take it a little farther say look to be human is to be being in the world with others we're in intrinsically social we can't escape it it's what we, it's who and how we are we're social beings, right? Relationships don't come later, right? As the mind, the rational ego looks out and finds other objects in its uh, perceptual space that it infers are also humans. And so it attaches to them and, and conveys and puts meaning on them as important. No, that's, you know, and others aren't just an array of stimulus configurations that we find personally satisfying or frustrating no i guess no 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 others are who we are and we are who they are we're we're part and parcel of each other right i like to think of it in terms of family we're we're familial beings and that's one of the i think beautiful truths of the restored gospel is that it's family all the way down not turtles not metaphysical entities not material families and families are neither metaphysical abstractions and they're not just mere material entities right that uh, families are dynamic historical moral agents in meaningful relationships pursuing certain goods right doing it well or less well but family right that you can't understand what it is to be a human being unless you start with social reality. We're being in a world, right? We're being in the world with others. That's who we are. We are, he says, we're mit Dasein, right? Uh, we are with others who are like us. And we construct and make sense of the world together. Because of them, I have a world in which to be. And I make it in certain ways. I make it and I understand it. I, I cast it in a certain way and, and articulate it. And I contribute to that um, as an active participant, right? Um, but, and, but he says, that's not all that's going on there, right? So it's being in, to be a human being, be in the, being in the world with others alongside things, right? He wants to be kind of clear here about this, alongside things. Um, because we're with other people in a way different than we are with stuff, with things, right? My experience, my relationship, my understanding of others is different than what goes on with this tool, this pen, right? Uh, I, I share a kind of experience of the world that I, with other people that I, I don't share with the pen. Uh, I'm worried about death. Death could happen at any time. We're mortal. We know this early on. We figured out death could come at any time, and it's all almost always outside of our control, right? Uh, so our mortality, the meaning of our life, purpose. What am I here for? What am I doing? Is this all there is? Those things. We all wrestle with those. Some of us try to escape it, right? But that's central to what it means to be a person. And, and I share that with other persons. I don't share that with a pen or an eraser or a whiteboard or any of those things because they're, they're not involved in it. That's not an issue for them. They're things. So I'm with others, but next to and alongside things. I use things. Something's really wrong if I'm using others. I'm mistaking others for something 
like a tool, and that's a bad idea. That's a, there's a problem. But um, let, me, let me give you some examples of, of what that means, right? So, so uh, I can move this pen, right? It's here. It's there. I can move the pen around. I can move the eraser around. I can move my chair around. I can move things. I can move you as a student. I'm your teacher. I could move you. Now, that means that I could literally pick you up and move you because you have some qualities that are kind of like an object. You have mass and weight and location. But I can move you with my words, my actions inspire you, frustrate you, depress you, bore you, whatever, right? I can move you to action, to deeper understanding, to thought. I can never move these in that way. I can only touch them, right? Um, it's touch. I can touch these. I can touch this, right? You can touch stuff. We touch stuff all the time. But we can touch each other. Right now, we can shake hands. We're not supposed to. That's why we're doing the video thing. But theoretically, there was a time on this planet when people could shake hands and we could touch each other that way. But right now, we're separated by miles, maybe even thousands of miles in time. And yet, I might be able to touch you with something I said, touch you in a way that these things could never be touched because we're with each other. We're with others. It's our constitution. It's who we are. It's our nature. But we're only alongside things. We use them. We manipulate them. But that's what being in the world means for Heidegger. And it's just, if you want to understand what it means to be in love, if you want to understand what it means to be a person, if you want to understand what it means to compete, be frustrated, to be depressed, to be unhappy, whatever, if you want to make sense of what it is to be a person, well, you got to focus on being with the historical, the moral context of the activity that these beings that we share and enact with one another, the purposes for which we do the things we do as moral agents. And you have to understand the physical context in which all of that takes place, right? If we were in the classroom, if we're in a lecture hall right now, I'd, I'd point this out a little bit. I'd talk about it in these ways, right? So imagine you're back, imagine you're back in that classroom. Um, which Heidegger says is another amazing thing, right? We could be right next to each other, but if I'm daydreaming, I can be miles away, even though we're right next to each other. And the reality of my experience of the world is I'm not right next to you, I'm somewhere else, right? Uh, and the rationalist and the empiricist said, wow, it's just a mere metaphor. Heidegger says, mm, metaphors come later. That's the experience. But anyway, so imagine, imagine you're back in the classroom, okay? What made that room a classroom? What makes it a classroom? Well, the rationalist says what makes it a classroom is that we have this idea that we impose meaning on. We have these ideas we impose on the world. We decided to, through process of deduction or intuition or whatever, that that's, that's what we will call this place. It's a, and here are the definitions of, and so on and so forth. And there's this abstract ideal classroom in Plato's heaven, and this mirrors that, it represents it, so it must be a classroom. The empiricists, they walk in and say it's classroom because we have associated certain perceptual experiences with rooms like this, uh, and we've dubbed them classrooms. It's a process of experience and training and conditioning by your society and other people. That's what made it a classroom. Heidegger said, Heidegger would look at it and say, no, what makes it a classroom is us and the room, right? We have assembled in the room as a professor and as students holding class. The room becomes a classroom because of what we're doing in it. But the room itself creates an atmosphere for professors and students in the very way it's constructed. There's really, there's no, it's chicken and egg, right? It, you can't separate them out. 
It's there. The classroom, the room itself, the way it's constructed, the purposes for which it was built, its very existence calls into existence, calls into meaning, a world of instruction, of education, of learning, of teachers and students, right? Uh, and teachers and students convey meaning to the classroom that it doesn't have when other kinds of meetings are taking place there, right? We create a world of meaning and the world of others and physical objects create us in the creation of that. This is what's often called the hermeneutic circle. It, and it's pointing the idea is there's no starting point here. There's no starting point. Understanding is always attacking between, a, a tacking back and forth between the parts and the whole. Right, um, and that the more we understand the specific, the more we understand the general, and change how we understand things in general, that changes how we understand the the specific. It goes back and forth and back and forth, endlessly. So, the process of interpretation, of making sense, what does this mean? The more I study something the more I come to understand what I didn't understand before. And so my knowledge has increased. I understand this thing better than I used to. And I now realize that I have new questions. I have something, it's, it's and I, my approach now is different to the thing I was studying before, right? It goes back and forth, it's meshed, you can't pull it apart. You can't separate these things out. For example, what does it mean to be in love? I might ask that question. I wonder what that's like. So I go and I talk to people who are in love, who've been in love, who are anticipating falling in love, but have never done it. Uh, and we, we talk in, in great detail. I get uh, their stories in as much detail as I can and try to understand their perspective and their experience. What's it mean? How does it flow? What about people who've been in love for a long time and those who just fell in love? How did the, how's that all play out? So on and so forth. And I come away and I go, ah, so that, I get it. That's, that's, uh, I, I kind of understand better now what it means to be in love. I have a much deeper, richer understanding. And I need to understand more because now new things are present to me that were never there before. New questions, new possibilities, things I had never considered before. Things I didn't even anticipate finding out. They're there now. So I got to go back and I got to do it more. I got to understand it more, right? This is called the hermeneutic circle. And Heidegger is the person mostly responsible for introducing the idea of hermeneutics into phenomenology. So I'm going to step back here and tell you just a little bit about hermeneutics. These are big new words. I get it. Uh, remember, phenomenology, focus on experience and meaning, the phenomena as they present themselves to us in our lived experience. Hermeneutics is the notion that that's a process of ongoing, constant interpretation, not mere interpretation. It's not subjectivity, right? Because my account of the world that we share of the things, it makes demands, right? I, I can't, I mean, you can't just step off of a cliff and not fall, right? There are some constraints on the interpretations that we can offer. We have to take account of the world as it presents itself. But hermeneutics, hermeneutics is about that interpretation and the constancy, the give and take, the back and forth of interpretation, that, that phenomena present themselves interpretative, interpretively to us. We're constantly interpreting, meaning making sense, striving to understand context. We're contextual ourselves. All right. Now, this comes from uh, way back in the day, right? You go back way back Thomas Aquinas time, right? 11th, 12th century, this sort of thing. Uh, biblical hermeneutics became important. So now the word hermeneutics, let me tell you this before I talk about biblical hermeneutics. Hermeneutics starts, uh, it gets its, its kickoff from Hermes, who was the Greek god. He was the messenger of the gods, right? Because people couldn't understand what the gods were saying. Because when Zeus is saying something, uh, it's lightning and thunder. What does that mean? How do I make sense of that, right? Uh, when... Athena has something to tell you. Well, it's a flock of ravens and how they fly. 
Uh, so Hermes is the messenger of the gods. He descends from Olympus and he speaks the human tongue and helps. He puts the ideas in the priest's head or people's minds and they, they understand what the portents and the omens mean, all of that, right? He's the messenger. This is why uh, he has winged sandals to let him fly from Olympus, right? Uh, and so he's all about understanding and meaning and interpretation. Hermes, right? He's also, by the way, he was the, the god of liars and thieves. We won't go there. But anyway, so Middle Ages, high Middle Ages, the scholars in the church, the theologians are like, look, we got to come up with some way of settling on what the right interpretation of scripture is. What does this passage in Isaiah or Revelations or Genesis, what does it really mean? What did God intend when he, he had these words put down on paper and given to us? But what do they mean? Because we disagree, right? There's, it's hard to get to agreement. We want to stamp out heresy and uh, so on and so forth. So we got to figure out how to interpret scripture. What's the proper way of making sense of the meaning of scripture? Well, they came up with a whole bunch of tools a whole bunch of ways of, of doing it. Well, you want, you want to understand the context in which this passage of scripture was written, the language it was written in, uh, who wrote it, how were the words used in other places, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? So really get as much context, as much perspective as you possibly can to try and settle on what makes sense, the best sense, what's the best fit for this meaning right, for this passage of scripture and its meaning. Well, it didn't take long for, uh, you know, a few centuries go by, and some people sat back and said, well, why, why do the Bible people get all the fun? Why do the biblical scholars get all the fun? Why can't we do this with any text? What does the white whale mean in Moby Dick? What did Melville mean by that? What's the imagery? What's, what's the symbolism? What was he trying to get across to us? The scarlet letter, what's Hawthorne? What's, what's going on with that? What's it mean, right? So let's look at the context. What else is Hawthorne and Melville wrote? And how does it show up? And what are the, let's get as much context and understand the language and the usage and the time period that they were writing in. How were the words used then? And so on and so forth. Get as much context as possible so that we can sit back and go, this is what, Shakespeare meant. This is what Melville meant. This is what Hawthorne meant. This is when they were doing. So this is literary hermeneutics, right? Um, and eventually, then it drifts over into law, right? Constitutional hermeneutics. What did the founders mean when they used this word? Uh, you know, in the in the Bill of Rights, they talked about militia, well-regulated militia. What did what did they mean by that? What did everybody mean? How did they understand it? Let's get the context. Let's dig in. That's called legal hermeneutics. Well, about the end of the 1800s, uh, there's a German philosopher, Wilhelm Diltag, uh, who comes along. And his name is spelled D-I-L-T-H-E-Y, Diltag. Diltag. Anyway, so Wilhelm comes along and he says, look, there seem to be two different kinds of sciences here. There's natural science. Doesn't seem to be a whole lot of interpretation going on. Seems to be a bunch of objects and the manipulation of those objects and the identification of the causes and effects that produce the behavior of those objects. That's natural science, not to right? Uh, the natural sciences, or Schaften, excuse me. Anyway, um, he says, but then there's stuff involving human beings, and we're not at all like planets and lava flows and. Uh, you know, tidal waves and earthquakes, billiard balls, we're not like that at all. And so the science of the human, if you're going to study human beings, you ought to use the methods appropriate to studying human beings, not use the methods of the natural sciences. They were designed to deal with objects, natural stuff, but human beings are different. Human beings are active, they're interpretive, they're busy making sense of the world. They experience the world in terms of meanings. So why not use the, the methods of uh, hermeneutics to try and understand the, what he called the Geisteswissenschaften, right? The spiritual sciences or the human social sciences, right? Let's do that. So you have to interpret. What does, you can't, uh, with a planet, you can say, well, why did the why did the planet behave this way? Why does it move in this fashion, right? Well, let's identify the causal forces and measure them, and, and we'll explain that. 
behavior, right? But you can't do that with human beings because the why did this person do what they just did is a question of their meanings, their perceptions, their understanding of the world, their purposes. And that all takes place in the context of relationships with other people who have purposes and meanings and perceptions and a world that's shared and, and a history that, and a language and a culture and all that. You got, so we got to dig down. What does it mean? Not what caused it. What does it mean that this person did what they did? Right? And that re that's an interpretive question. Well, Heidegger picks up on a little bit of that. Heidegger was Husserl's student, so he's got the phenomenology part there. He breaks ranks with uh, Husserl, uh, and we won't go into how they break ranks, uh, but they do break ranks a little bit because Heidegger felt Husserl spent too much time focusing on consciousness and hadn't really gotten as far away from Descartes as he needed to, but I won't get into all the details there. But Heidegger wants to look at this, says, well, if we're starting from this position that to be human is to be a meaning making, being in a world of meanings that have been made and which the person is making in this relational nexus with others and things, right? Then to understand what it means to be a person is an interpretive act. Not only are human beings interpretive beings all the way down, but to study them, we must study them on their own terms. We must interpret makes sense. Describe in as much detail as possible the phenomena of falling in love, losing the big game, being angry, struggling with isolation in the face of a plague. You name it, folks. Right? We experience it, Heidegger says, let's dig out the meaning. Let's get to the meaning of what this is about. So one of the consequences for psychology uh, is to say, Instead of quantitative experimental methods, instead of relying on those for everything, everything, to try and identify causes and stimuli and variables and come up with abstract principles of causality and all that stuff, let's, let's focus on qualitative methods, not quantitative. So we're dealing with quantities of stuff. Let's focus on qualities, meanings. So qualitative methods, let's interrogate people's experience as they lived it, as they understood it, the meanings, right? So let's go and talk to them about their lives. Let's observe those lives unfolding. Let's be part of that and provide rich, thick descriptions. Well, what happens is somebody invariably says, well, that's not very precise. That's all mere subjectivity. No, you're still stuck in the Cartesian split there. That's a, sub, that's a Cartesian split concern. There is no subjectivity. Uh, it, there's intersubjectivity. We share and create these meanings together. The researcher is part of the researched. And the participants contribute to the meaning and the making of the findings. Right? Um, well, that's, that's still not very precise. Numbers are more precise, but the, the hermeneutic and the phenomenological thing per se, no, 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 no. The numbers are really precise when you're measuring measurable stuff, but the numbers aren't very precise at all when you're trying to measure stuff that is not measurable, that's meaningful, that's relational, that's interpersonal. You can come up with these numbers, but it's not. So for example, I would often tell uh, students in, in qualitative methods courses, look, what's more precise? I give you a questionnaire with 20 or 30 questions about relationship satisfaction, and you get to rate these questions. Some of them are throwaways. Some of them are questions are meant to determine if you're lying and presenting yourself better or in a better light. And some of them are really, you know, a handful, a dozen or so are really about uh, your marital satisfaction or your relationship satisfaction. And they're on a Likert scale, one to seven, you know, from strongly disagree to strongly agree and all points in between. And you have to pick a number. And you've had this experience before, right? Where you're saying, well, that's kind of a five, but kind of a four. I, I, uh, it's, I, sometimes it's, a, I don't know. Uh, you're having a translation problem. How do I turn my experience into a number? Right, you're struggling with that. And say, oh, I wish I could do four point three eight five nine some whatever, but uh, it's a five. Well, no, it's a four. Anyway, when you're struggling to take your everyday experience in the language in which you have it, 
turn it into this abstract language of numbers, right? But anyway, we, so we give the, the survey out there. You get all the numbers back. I get the survey back from 500 people and I average all their numbers and I come back and I say, oh, look at this. On average, uh, these people in this socioeconomic status versus those people in that socioeconomic status, these people report uh, a higher, a statistically, statistically significantly higher uh, rate of marital satisfaction than those people. And really, what 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 are the numbers? Well, here it's uh, it's 5.216, and over there it was only 4.014. How precise! That's incredibly precise. It's very specific. We're down to the third decimal point, right? Well, then there's this other way. How about we talk to people about their experience? We ask probing, persistent questions. We examine our own assumptions and biases. We look at the largest context. I sit down with you, right? Uh, I sit down with you and say, hey, tell me about when you met your wife. What did you, what, what did it for you? Right? And tell me about how your relationships developed. And, and then I'm going to talk to her too about the same together. And then maybe even have you both at some point come in together. And you want to share your wedding out? All right, tell me about that. Share, share that with me. And, uh, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to people who are getting ready to go through a divorce. And their stories were very similar to the other people's stories. But things, well, where did that go wrong? What happened? What's this? And we're going to kind of work these out together and talk this out, make sense of it, and I'm gonna come up with a story out of that. I'm gonna kind of pull out what the essential features. It seems like across the board, people experiencing the world this way, they, they experience, these are the patterns. These are the ideas and the themes in their experience. And I might just take that right back to you and say, hey, here's, here's how I tried to understand all the stuff that you and other people have been telling me. What do you think of that? Have I, have I been true to your experience? Have I done a good job of that? Or did I miss something? Did I misunderstand? Teach me if I did. Help me to understand where I got it wrong. And, uh, and so we can kind of understand this in, in a deeper account. And, but what I have, right? What I have at the end of this whole process is this really rich account of actual people's actual experiences in all their glorious ambiguity and specificity, their glorious s s context. And no two people had exactly the same experience, but there's commonalities. And I got all of that there. So given that, which view is really more precise and detailed? A set of abstract numbers that apply to a statistical myth, the average person, or rich, detailed accounts from real people about their real lives, their real experiences, their real relationships. The phenomenologist, the hermeneutic thinker, they're going to look at that and say, hey, it's no contest, right? Um, and like I said before, there's, uh, there's a lot of connection you should see here with William James, right? This was James's approach to the study of, of the psychology of religion. Um, this was the varieties of religious experience. Notice the title, the varieties of religious experience. He went out and he studied actual peoples. He talked to real people. He looked at their accounts, their, their stories, their narrations, and all of that to try and assemble it together to get some sense of what's, what's common here. What, what's going on with this thing called religious experience that shows up in all these different ways, but has some similarities Let's get a deeper understanding, right? So in that sense, William James doing that work was a, a hermeneutic phenomenologist. There's a mouthful for a party sometime, right? Uh, I had to write a dissertation back in the day, and uh, it was awful. Hermeneutic phenomenology, a little hyphen in the middle to type that 500 times a day. And I was, I was down to... Uh, the very last third of my final chapter in my dissertation when a friend pointed out that, oh yeah, hey, your word processor has these little things called macros. Why don't you just come up with control H. Permanent phenomena. That was a great experience. Stupid story. Sorry. I got sidetracked. It never has happened before. 
I don't know why it happened just now. I never go on tangents. It's absurd. Who would do that? Laser focus. Anyway, I hope uh, I hope now after this long winding lecture, uh, you have some sense of what phenomenology is about, what a phenomenological psychology would be after, what it would look like. Um, I didn't really talk much about how therapy would be played out, um, but if you have questions about that, I'm happy to try and answer some of those things, maybe point you to some other things. I'm going to post this video and maybe uh, point you to a couple of others uh, so that you can get as full of a uh, kind of set of information and experience with this as possible. Um, and then I'm going to turn off the camera now and I'm going to pace back and forth here for a while because I'm bursting at the seams with energy because this stuff is totally cool to me. It's a, a radically different way of doing psychology and thinking about ourselves, the world. Um, it really opens up a space. I, it opens up a great space to talk about the living God or the restoration and his involvement in our lives. He's not just an idea that we have, that you have to believe in the idea or not. No, he's a person, he's part of it. So if I were gonna modify Heidegger, we're being in the world with others alongside things, intimately so with God, right? And he with us. But anyway, at a time, I've used enough of your time. So I gotta go do some pacing. So I'll talk to you another time.